on the subject. These are the two I'll get. This costs about ten dollars, and another Dover, maybe twelve. This might cost thirty, but these are. And I know there's some pirated PDF running around of this book, so you might be able to. Yes, so it's Born Hoffman and Van der Holst. This is called light scattering by small particle. This is absorption scattering of light by small particle. And that's for the topic of what we'll talk about today is how light interact with particles. Highly, highly, highly recommended. Here she comes. So um, every year I wonder whether or not we should do this, go through this painful process, and I hope convince you that we should. But it, it resonates with some more than with others. Uh, so the problem at hand is as follows. You have a particle with specific size shape, optical properties, that is illuminated by an arbitrarily polarized monochromatic light wave. And you, what you need to determine is the electromagnetic field at all point outside, which is the scattered light, scattered or absorbed. Where does it go? Uh, we, for the talk today, since we're doing myth theory, we'll assume uh, that we're dealing with a non-polarized plane harmonic wave and we're dealing with spherical particles. But in principle, you could do the same problem applies to any shape, any polarization, etc., etc. And we will talk a little bit about polarization, but we'll assume a non-polarized incident light. Okay, why should we care about optical theory and meat solution? And why do we care about it? First, when we calibrate the instrument with beads, we go to me theory to tell us what, should, what we should expect for a given concentration of beads of a given size and a given uh, composition, given material, what is the scattering we should expect from the suspension. And then we can put our instrument, we can put them inside our instrument if it's the least chamber or in a bucket and act, or in a flow cytometer, run the beads through and then use those to calibrate our instrument. So it's very, very useful. And for this, w people use expensive NIST traceable beads. So they're, they know exactly the size distribution, they're, they're spherical, etc., etc. In addition, and I hope to convince you in a little exercise we'll do at the end and later on, that for a given concentration of particle of a given size, wavelength of light, something about the index of refraction, we know something about the signal our instrument should give us. And if they don't, it can help us tell us that there's a problem where we're, you know, our calibration is off or something really weird is happening in those waters. So I, I put here example of three graduates of this class. They've taken the codes they got in the class and used them in publication that they've done. So the latest one is Tiho Kostadinov, who used me theory in his thesis, and he continues to use it, to modulate particle size, I mean, and modulating particle size distribution in the ocean to look at the effect on RRS. And then invert RRS to give you size distribution in the ocean. So this is Tiho's approach. He pushed me theory to space. Giorgio used me theory to analyze the yield cycle in scattering and backscattering. He looks at the yield cycles that he observes in the ocean and then infer from using me theory is infer information about their growth rate. And finally, Rebecca Green, she's the first one that I remember using it, um, use it to basically analyze flow cytometer data by assigning size based on forward and back scattered light. It's actually it's side scattered, it's not back scattered light. So in a flow cytometer, you send bead one at a time, you get side, you get forward, but you also get that same information for cells, phytoplankton cells. And by Running a set of me theory, she was able to constrain the properties of the cells she was running. She worked with uh, Heidi Sosik, it's a thesis with Heidi. So there's use, while you might not see any use for it today, you might be surprised that it might be useful for you in the future. So in, a, in um, analyzing light interaction with matter, we care about two orthogonal um, fields the electric field and the magnetic field. 
And so and some of you are now going to lose me for a few slides. Uh, but we have to go through that painful process. You have an incident light coming in. You have a scattered light coming out. And then you have outside the particle regime and inside the particle regime. And you're, we're going to expand the way the solution works. You're expanding all these into harmonics, into waves solution. And then you require them to obey certain laws at the boundaries and at infinity. And by doing that, you're, you're building your solution. So the light outside is based on, the, the light outside, uh, outside eventually is going to be based on the sum of the incident and the scattered electric wave and similarly for, for, the, uh, for, for the magnetic field. Okay, so we have this simple harmonic wave. So again, I told you in the past, we can use exponential and then the real part of this to denote a wave. And this is a wave propagating in space and in time. Those of you who have done mathematics, this is for you the bread and butter of everyday life. Those of you who've grown up doing biology or geology, this looks like Chinese. I realize that. But and these might satis must satisfy Maxwell's equation. Here, Maxwell's equation. It's a set of four equations uh, that tells us everything we should know about how light's going to uh, behave in, in the environment. And there's two parameters here. This, uh, the, this is called the permittivity. This is called the permeability. But in short, these are properties of the material. While this, the omega, is the frequency of light. And k is information about the wavelength. What is h? h is the magnetic field. And this one is the uh, electric field. And as you know, light has two, and they, they're, they're orthogonal to each other. And then there's the orthogonal to the direction of propagation. You should look at it that way. OK, so we can define this uh, k. And then we can reduce the vector equation to the following equations with the boundary condition that right on, across, on the boundary of the particle, uh, the fields have to be continuous. And it turns out that it follows directly from energy conservation. We also expect that in infinity, the solution is bounded. It doesn't go to, it doesn't explode to infinity. And that allows us to throw away a whole bunch of solution, wave solution that are just not physical. So we only keep physical solutions. Um, and then an arbitrary polarized light can be expressed as superposition of two orthogonal polarized states. And this is expressed here. You have uh, uh, a parallel and an orthogonal uh, plane of polarization uh, relative to the direction of uh, no, it's not relative. So you, you, have, you have two directions to which you can decompose your polarized light, any kind of polarized light. Uh, and that ends up being described by matrices that have to do with the azimuthal angle. So the angle, if this is direction of light, this is the azimuthal angle, and then there's the direction relative to uh, the direction of propagation, which is theta. Z is the, the Z is the coordinate in which the light goes forward to. So the light that you start with is easily described in an x, y, z plane. But this is what we call z. On the other hand, the light scattered from a particle, we expect to radially propagate. And so this is r. So we have these mixed units between the direction of propagation and the direction going from the and the origin is in the center of my particle. So I call this z, but r goes in all direction in that, in that. And again, this is notation. For sphere, it turns out this is a, these two elements are 0. So this is where sphere is so much easier than any other particle. We have symmetries that allows us to throw a whole bunch of uh, things outside. And again, then we can solve each element relative to itself. You don't have to remember any of it. It just I'm just It's all in here, by the way. It's all simply copied from here. But now we can talk about intensity of, electric, of the electric field in watts per steradian. It's related to that matrix, and it's related to the incident light 
with a specific polarization. And similarly, at the orthogonal axis, we can relate it to this uh, element of the matrix. While for unpolarized light, I mean, the, the, um, the full intensity relates to these two elements. And they'll come back afterwards. So the way you solve something like this is you come up with a series of polynomes. Each part of it, it can be sinuses for a certain problem, like the, the, the tidal problem, we, use si we decompose into sinuses. Here we compose into other waves, and these are waves that are symmetric in R. They have some component of Z. And then we just sum the harmonic, and we, we forced on, on each order to obey the boundary condition. And then it turns out, and as you'll see today, that for a certain type of harmonic, if you use a larger, and, and these are the ones in the code we're going to use today, the larger the particle, the slower the convergence. So you say, after a certain time, you say, OK, I got enough to where I want to get, because the solution doesn't change anymore. So it turns out the first harmonic could be, do very well, a very tiny particle. But for a large particle compared to the wavelength, you have to go 100. Um, a hundred elements, a hundred solution, a hundred components of that series solution. You can completely get all the information of the polarized, uh, and this is all uh, related to what you saw in Ken's talk before. Those are directly related to the output, which means, and this is the only thing I want you to remember, this is the Mueller matrix you saw before. This is the incident. This is the scattered. What it, all it means is that the type of code you're going to get today, you can also calculate polarization results simply from the output. So this deals with the full um, uh, polarization of, 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 uh, of the scattered light. Because even if you start with a light that's unpolarized, the scattered light is polarized. And I'll remind you, when you looked in the lab at um, shining a laser into a tank, and depending on the side you look and on, the, on rotating the polarizer on its axis, you get the light to fade or not to fade. And that just in this case, you started with a polarized, linearly polarized light, and you're looking at the angle at 90 degrees where with small particle, you'd get the most effect of polarization. And so depending on the angle you're at, you might either see scattered light or not see at all. And if you started with an unpolarized light, if you, used, if you shine a regular flashlight, you'll see that when you're in 90 degrees, you can, and it, you're dealing with Rayleigh um, or very small particle, you can simply by sh changing the orientation of your polarizer, you can see or not see light. If it's larger particles, some light is still, um, you, you'll get still some light in some polarization, but again, most of it can be uh, occluded. And it's the same as when you looked at the sky. You have the sun. You're looking at, say, 90 degrees to it. You're looking at the skylight. It's highly polarized, again, because you're dealing with Rayleigh scattering. So in, an, in short, you get information on polarization. Again, thanks. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, and, so and I'll, show the, I'll show that the later. Relationship yeah. S1 and S2 the the it's coming. Okay. These are different S's. You're absolutely right. They're, they're, they're so th S1 these S1 are not, S1 these S1 absolutely, S1 these S1 elements are not the same as the big S, S1 big, yeah. big S1, big S2. And the S1 thing S1 to remember S1 though, yeah, abs you're absolutely right, is that everything here is still uh, angular dependent. Okay. So. Again, we bring in s symmetries associated with sphere. We're down to one, two, three, four elements in the Mueller matrix. Those are the only ones that are independent. So out of 16 elements, you're down to four. And now, here we relate these S1 and S2 from the previous slides, uh, these ones, the ones that we, we solve for to the Mueller matrix element. And these are complex numbers, so you have a complex conjugate, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have to get into that. And then you get into things. The, the first element, this one has to do with the volume scattering function. 
as you remember, and if we normalize all the other byte, this one will give you the depolarization ratio, how, uh, the linear depolarization ratio. And again, these are things that can covered. So the solution method, I'm going to go pretty fast in here. Again, I, I think we're almost done with equation, if not completely. Uh, the solution method is to expand incident and scattered light field into spherical harmonic function uh, for each polarization, match solution at the boundary of the particle, and require them to be finite at large distances. So they cannot, they, they cannot explode at infinity. The input you're going to need is the wavelength at the medium, in the medium. So let's spend a little time talking about that. And how do we calculate the wavelength of the medium, in the medium? So I hope you remember from Kurtz that as you go across a boundary, say air to water, what is conserved in terms of property of the light field? Frequency. And frequency has unit of per second, one over time. Okay, so, and every time I have to go through it in my head in order to, to remember how to do, uh, what changes and how it changes. Okay, so frequency stays constant as I go. Now, how do I relate frequency to properties like wave speed, speed of the wave, and to wavelength? Because this is what I want to, so I have one over time, I have the speed of light, C, so this is, and then I have wavelength. So wavelength is length, C is length over time, so to get 1 over time, this is going to be C over lambda. Okay, speed versus lambda. So now I have one medium, say air, C in air over lambda air, have to be equal to C water over lambda water, because the frequencies are the same. So far, so good. So now I'm going to, I want to see how does the wavelength in the medium, in water in my case, compare to wavelength in air. So lambda water will be lambda air times C in water divided by C in air. C is the velocity. Now, is light faster in Water or in air? Anybody remember? Air, air. It's faster in air. Another way to think about it is opposite of sound. Sound is much faster in the water than in air. It's five times rapid. So, but it turns out how the index of refraction is really the reciprocal of the, the speeds. So the ratio of the speed seawater to sea air is really n of water, uh, n of air divided by n of water. This is the index, the real part of the index of refraction. So anybody remember what's the index of refraction of water relative to air? 1.34. So this is equal lambda air over 1.34. So my wavelength in water is about, this is four-thirds, or is three-quarter my wavelength in air? Yes? Why are we doing it with respect to air? Because, oh, it's the same, uh, call it vacuum. The differences are uh, completely negligible, at least with what we're doing. So, yeah, I mean, this is, we're doing it, yeah. It's vacuum. In principle, we do have, we reference everything to va we can reference everything to vacuum because then you don't have to worry about the air mass you're in and what's the pressure. But it's the the tiny changes between air and vacuum. But this give, this tells you several things. One is that the wavelength perceived by the cell, a phytoplankton cell in water, is very different than the one you think it is. What you call blue, they might call it blue, but it has a different wavelength. And this is important because of, again, these processes we talked to you about. When you, when you talk about scattering, what you care about is the size of the particle relative to the wavelength. And if you use the wrong wavelength, a wavelength in air, 
you, you're going to have the resonance at a completely different size than you'll have it with, with one that has to do with the size of the particle. So it's important to remember that we care about the wavelength in the medium. Okay? We care about the size, the physical size of the particle. And as inputs to the code, it has to simply be in the same units as the wavelength. So if you want put one in micron, put the other in micron. If you put one in nanometers, put the other in nanometers. But if you will not, there's, you'll have problem. And then the index of refraction relative to the medium as well. So relative to water, not relative to air. You can do, as long as you write, well, best to put it relative to the medium you're in. Put it relative to uh, water. So we do everything relative to water. Okay, this is critical. So a phytoplankton, for example, will have a real index of refraction of about 1.05. And an inorganic particle may be 1.2 or something of, to that effect. That would be the real part. And the imaginary part will be on the order in an absorption band. It's going to be like this, complex, and this will be much smaller say something like this just as an into to, to build intuition to the values and we write it in complex notation simply to remind ourselves that this is the evanescent part this is the part that's attenuated attenuating within the the particle and from this we can immediately form a non-dimensional parameter which is what the solution cares about because physicists like to do things in non-dimensional unit and so we get a size parameter by d over lambda. The other thing we get is another parameter, which we call rho, which is usually defined as 2x n minus 1. Now, 1 is the medium, so in case of water. And why do we need something like this? Because if you remember, when we did the putting a rod in the, in the uh, oil and we suddenly disappeared, your interaction depends on how different your index of refraction, the scattering part of the interaction, how different your index, the real part of your index of refraction is from the medium. So size matters, but it's not everything. How, how different you are from, your index, from the medium index of refraction will determine the strength of the, the scattering. And then finally, we'll also need something that has to do with n prime because that will tell us about absorption. We'll dominate the absorption. There will be some interaction between scattering and absorption, but this is to order one what's going to dominate the interactions. So we need, this is the information you'll need in order to uh, be able to generate the uh, interaction, the solution for the interaction of light with matter. Okay, what will be the output that you'll see from these codes? You'll get something called an efficiency factor. And again, you'll see those in many papers. So it's particularly a series of very important paper by Bricot and by Morel in, in the 80s, where they applied me theory to scattering and absorption by phytoplankton. So you have these cues. These are non dimensional outputs, the unitless. And for example, the efficiency factor for attenuation is the light attenuated by the particle divided by the light impinging on it. So how much of the light that impinged got attenuated? Similarly with QA, which is the absorbing part of it. Then you have these two scattering, scattering matrix elements, and we assume azimuthal symmetry, so they only be function of theta, the, uh, the, the angle relative to the direction the light propagates. And from these, we can compute the efficiency factor from scattering, which is simply QC minus QA, and we can compute the volume scattering function, which is a function of these two. And again, these are complex. So these are the absolute value of a complex quantity, and it's a function of theta. And we can calculate all these other polarization elements using S1 and S2. So you get everything you need for the Mueller matrix. 
all of it comes out. But it gives you zero intuition. So let's start building some intuition to how we move from this to, oh, maybe it's in the next slide. How we move from this, yes, it's in the next slide, to optical properties. So let's link those to IOPs. So the first thing that you'll see often is people will, in, or direction people uh, move, is they talk about this extinction coefficient, or uh, extinction cross-section, or absorption cross-section. All these are is simply you take the Q, so these C, C of extinction, or C and absorption, will be equal to the Q of extinction, or of absorption, times the cross-sectional area. So this is pi d squared over 4. And from unitless, we now have units of whatever units we have in the d squared. So let's use it in meters. So this will have units of meter square. What do I do with that? And that, what it gives me, really, is how much of the cross-section of the light impinging is being affected by the particle. And it's very useful because we have, now we can start thinking about shadows. You know, if I shine light over something and all this is occluded, this is one cross-section, one time the cross-section. It actually turns out that it's two because there's one what doesn't go through and then there's about the same amount of cross-section that's the light scattered elsewhere. So then a Q of two for a large, for something really large relative to the wavelength is what you're going to get for an extinction, um, an extinction efficiency factor. Yes, Colin? So remember when we talked about scattering, we talked about how we had some rays going through the particles and refracting and coming back out at different angles. And then we also had diffraction going around the particles. So that, that is light rays never actually touched the particles. They never touched the geometric cross-section. And you can think about it as an island on which you have uh, wave impinging. So here, if everything is absorbed, nothing goes through. You're so big that all the light through is absorbed. And then when you come around, here, these, suddenly these are going to bend to each other. And this is called Babinet's principle, the one by which you get a, a Q of 2 for attenuation of light when you have a particle that's much bigger than the wavelength. So two cross sections. Okay, but now, okay, this is still in unit three that are not IOPs. So how do I get to IOPs? It, you multiply by concentration. So you, you, you will, if you want the beam attenuation now, or the, let's do the absorption first. If I want the absorption, what I need is the concentration of particles. So concentration. This will be in numbers per meter cubed. Multiplied by my, my absorption cross-section, so by my QA times my cross-section area, pi d square over 4. And here I'm done, because I have units of, this is units of meter square. I'm in unit of inverse meters. I calculate absorption for a certain number of particles per meter cubed. So I moved from this abstract solution, series solution of this weird problem into something I can compare with measurements. If I have exactly 500 beads per meter cube, I can go from, from this calculation to what absorption should I measure on this. Now, what do you think is QA for a very large particle? If I have a very large particle and I'm shining light to it, what will be, how much of its cross-section is absorbing? All of it, which will give me a Q of? One. So QA will be one. Exactly. If I absorb all the light that goes through. So now I can, if QA is one, I can even by in my head do 
If I know their size, I know their concentration. Assume a Q of one, up, I have absorption. You'll have to have a QB of one because they have to sum to two. But this is for particle very large relative to the wavelength. So that's the Babinet. That's a Babinet principle, yeah. But the thing the Babinet principle is that QC is equal to. And then depending on if they're not absorbing at all, which I don't know of a substance that doesn't absorb at all. But if they're not absorbing, then you can have a, uh, um, a QB of two. But that's if, Q, if there's no absorption whatsoever in it. Yeah. None of them go the They're either scattered by going through it, and then you get the reflection, I mean reflected, diffracted, or refracted. OK. So s exactly the same algebra we can use to do attenuation. We can use to do scattering. Ah, so I, what I didn't tell you is how do we go about scattering. Uh, scattering is the same, but I didn't tell you how we go about the volume scattering function. So the out, from the output, I do get the phase function. So the phase function is there. It's in the output. And if I wanted beta, what I have to do is multiply by QB, multiply by pi d squared over 4, and then multiply, because this is normalized, remember, and then multiply by the concentration. And then I get the volume scattering function. So all these things, and then I can, so in, in Wayne Slade, actually I should have added him to the list. When Wayne Slade came up with a method to calibrate the list to do volume scattering function, this is exactly the calculation he did. He used me theory, highly um, NIST traceable beads of different sizes, size distributions, we'll talk about it in a second, and then calculate what the VSF should be and then force the instrument to agree with that, calculate coefficient that will make it agree with, you know, in magnitude to that volume scattering, and then tested it with another bead, just to see that indeed it, it worked. So how do we do population? If it's monodispersion, we just multiply by the concentration as we did there. If we have polydispersion, so now we have discrete beans, we have in different size, we have different number of particles. We'll simply sum our numbers for each bin. So let's say you have output from a call to counter or output from a list, and you wanted to rebuild what, the, what you're going to get. You have to multiply the concentration in each bins, this uh, efficiency factor in each bins, and this uh, cross-sectional area to get your... Uh, IOP. And then if you use a continuous size distribution, say a power law like, then you you can do it in a in a in a way that's you can you discretize something that looks like this. Um, okay. But before I, I want to get some intuition from you on on these Qs, Cs, etc. So what we found is Q, since it's a, a, a ratio of two of this light attenuated on the particle or absorbed by light impinging, it's bounded. It's something that doesn't grow to infinity. We said that for a very large particle, it goes to 2 or to 1. So this is a bounded quantity. What about this Cx? How do you think this goes as diameter change? This guy. So this is bounded. It's less than 2 and bigger than 0. It cannot be negative. So physically, it has to be between 2 and 0. What can you tell me about the cross-sections? Is it bounded? What? It goes like cross-sectional area. So the bigger you are, the more cross-section you have. So if you have one particle, if I have a single particle, and I ask you, is a bigger particle scattering more than a smaller particle, the answer is yes. If I have one within my volume, one per meter cubed, I have the same concentration, one particle per meter cubed, the bigger the particle, the more interaction you're going to get. Okay? So while the Qs, and we're going we're gonna to plot some soon, and you guys are going to be plotting them, while the Qs are bounded, the Cs we expect, 
C A, this is D, to go like D squared. The bigger the particle, and therefore it follows that the IOPs, and I, the, I, the absorption for one particle that's a micron is going to be larger, most likely, I mean, within the modulation of Q, than a particle that's four times smaller. And we'll have less absorption per particle than the larger one. So this is per particle. Now we can ask the question, this is, these are the things that I showed you in my previous lecture. Well, but I care per mass, because I care about POC. I want to know per chlorophyll, per, per concentration, per mass of particle, how the IOPs behave. So now I'm going to take these guys, but I'm going to go, so remember I told you attenuation is going to be this times the concentration. But now I want to divide it per mass. I want to know what my attenuation per mass might be. OK? So here I have mass. So here we have things going like uh, mass will be proportional to concentration time density. So mass will be concentration, density, and volume. Is this clear? Density or total volume of the particle, but concentration and the volume of particle, per particle. Stop me if it's not clear. So concentration, I throw out. Now I have this guy, and this is bounded except for, so I have my Q's times pi d squared over 4. But on the bottom, I took the concentration out. I have density of the particle. Let's say dry mass. So it doesn't change much between organic and inorganic. And then I'll have the volume. Pi d cubed over 8, I think it is. OK? So look, I have d squared. 1 over d. So here I have the just d. So how does this behave as d goes up? And it turns out, and this is what I showed you, this is the resonance curve we get, where this goes like 1 over d. This is how I generated them. There's a certain size where, if I'm very big, q stop changing. Things fall like 1 over d. But in the smaller size, I'm getting this increase because Q itself increases faster than D does. And we'll get there. But again, depending on what you're after, you can use me theory to give you a sense of what to expect. These are the resonances I talked to you about, you know, on the order of 1 to 5 micron, dependent for scattering, for attenuation, things like that. Does this ring a bell? Bring us back to... So this is when I normalize per mass. If I don't normalize per mass and simply ask, Per con you know, if I have a concentration of one particle in my volume, that was increasing like d squared for large particles. These were the, these are these Cx, etc. So this is the beam attenuation for one particle. But then I'm not conserving mass because the big one has much more mass than a small particle. So what currency you use matters. Okay, we did this. Next, so. In the days before computing, it, people found it extremely, extremely useful to approximate the solution because otherwise you'd have to go every night home and run it for a whole night before you got the solution for one size particle. And convergence is slow for large particle or the day when, po when computers were very slow. So what people did is to, to divide the me solution into certain regime where I can do it analytically. I can get analytical solution. It's, it's, very it's also convenience for building intuition. So you'd get things like the Rayleigh regime, where a particle is much smaller than the wavelength. And you'll have a certain rho. The rho is the one, is the 2 pi d over lambda n minus 1. This is our rho, and the x is pi d over lambda. So in certain 
limits, you can throw a lot of the elements of the solution and just keep a few, and things become easy to do by hand and build intuition. So we have four regimes that are us usually used. The first one is Rayleigh. Rayleigh is very small particles, dissolved material, uh, molecules in the atmosphere. Then we have a transition region called the rayleigh gans debye based on the names of the people who derived it. Then we have the Van der Holst regime, which has been used a lot in the ocean because this is the region that's most applicable to phytoplankton. And then we have geometrical optics, which for a large particle. And here you have them as part of a, just as the shading, as you change from dissolved organic material, truly soluble, colloids, viruses. And then you have phytoplankton going from pico to micro, bacteria, um, SPM, etc. And bubbles are stranding between the van der Hals and the geometric, though they have a very strong index of refraction change. So I give you this page is part of the material you guys have in the in the uh, in your folder for today's lab, and these are examples of these approximations. And what are the assumption one makes to um, to uh, uh, when are they applicable? And hem, M here is the index of refraction plus I N prime. This is often how people write it, but they might write N prime as a K. They might write it with a minus sign. All of these notations are you might find. So if, uh, if we do this, the absolute value of a complex number is simply the square root of N squared plus N prime squared. Um, so in that case, in the Rayleigh regime, you have uh, y you can you get an analytical solution for QA that's based on the imaginary number, based on your index of refraction. This is important uh, because only the imaginary part affects your your absorption in this regime. Uh, you have your scattering QA, QC is simply the sum of these two. You get a backscattering um, that's half of the total scattering because it's four aft symmetric. And the phase function is an analytical function um, that, that is very simple. So it, with these, you can do everything by hand. Then you have the rayleigh gans debye uh, We don't have to get into it. But the one you're going to use today, uh, very soon on an Excel spreadsheet, is the one called anomalous diffraction or the van der Hulst approximation. Uh, it allows you to be to have a particle that's big relative to the wavelength, but the index refraction is not very different from the median. Although rho can be large, so this is m minus one, which which can happen because you're multiplying it by the by x. Then you're going to get an efficiency factor for c, for a, b will be the difference between them. There is no uh, um, solution for the phase function that come out of it. Uh, and you're going to plot these, these parameters very soon with Excel. Um, and then finally, geometrical optics here. Uh, these come from mostly from here. And if they're not here, they're in here. So if you're interested, you know where to find more. So yes. There are two people in the back. So those were papers that were written in the 80s where they were trying, because they didn't have a lot of instrumentation, they were trying to figure out what the optical properties of particles in the oceans would be if we knew something about their size and if we knew something about their index of refraction. And so they made the, they used the anomalous diffraction approximation so that they could solve things simply, as Mano just said. And so what it allowed to model the scattering of red light in the ocean. And 
then when you have very simple transmissometers, which measure scattering or attenuation in the red, then they can do these calculations. So then they start getting more complex, and then you can pick another wavelength where maybe there isn't much of it. And now you can say, well, how much of the light is absorbed and how much of it is scattered? Then you can start adding in particles of different types, say minerals. And there's a great paper, set of papers that Darius and Kurt put together where they basically looked at the optical efficiency factors of every particle that they could imagine in the ocean. They did mineral particles, detrital particles, cytoplankton particles, they, and they calculated from meat theory what, um, what their absorption and scattering properties were going to be. And then they used the size distribution, what Amanda was just talking about, and they said, okay, well, how many viruses do we have? How many small phytoplankton do we have? How much mineral dust do we have? And they basically, from first principles, from a reductionist view, built up the ocean from particles using these equations. Did you, they probably didn't use it. Did you use the anomalous diffraction? You might have used the full B. No, you but you could I do it from anomalous diffraction. Cranked it all through me theory on yeah. the computer and waited three weeks. But, you, but the point is, for most things in the ocean, you can use these really simple equations. And so you can derive from first principles from particle composition and concentration, A, B, and C, which is really powerful when you don't have optical sensors. You do have satellites in front of And now when you do have optical sensors, it's even more powerful, as Amanda has said. So you think about this from like building up the bar. And so, going inverse, this is building forward. But now, let's say, well, I have this mineral particle. I don't know its index of refraction. How can I figure out what it might be? So, there's lab methods. For the real part of the index of refraction, there's relatively simple lab methods where you have oils that to whom you figured simply by light bending, what the index of refraction is, and then you pass them, just like the oil we had, you go, I'm putting my particle in an oil that's 1.01. .01. I get X scattering. So I plot. Here is N. Here is how much scattering I get. And then I'm putting it in a 1.02 oil. And I'm getting, say, less scattering. And what you're finding is there will be a minima here, somewhere, which is when you're matching the index of refraction of your medium. You're closest to it. That's where the minimum of scattering. And ah, quartz is 1.18 in the visible. I mean, and again, it changes with wavelength. You can do it, but it but it's, doesn't change very rapidly. So this gives me the real part. OK, now I know the real part of my index of refraction. What about the real? Sorry, this should be real, not the absolute value. What about the imaginary part? You can do exactly. So what people have done is do measurements of absorption and then invert those to give you the end prime that you should get. And those paper by Morel and Bricot, this is how they determined what's the in, in, uh, you need the absorption of the material if it was not packaged, if it was in a dissolved form. And this is how you determine it by doing an inverse cons inverse me uh, uh, calculation. Or you do it directly by measuring it. But again, it's concentrated chlorophyll. It's not so something that huge amount of absorption. But you get this index refraction that isn't really an index refraction. It's, it's the attenuation. It's a me equivalent. Yes, it, it's, it's the imaginary. It's, it's, it, yes, it's, it's this construct that we call the imaginary part of the index of refraction. So but even the real part, it's, it's like some average. Absolutely. So what, what? So this will be good for quartz. But what? 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 Uh, what? What? Kent tells me, and is absolutely true. You take a phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, the dry material might have a certain amount. The, the cell wall has a certain amount of index of refraction. The cytoplasm has a different amount of index of refraction. And for this calculation, we assume some sort of a average index of refraction. When I tell you 1.05. 1.05 is neither the absorb the the uh, the index refraction of the cell wall. It's not the, the 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 one of the chloroplast. It's not the one of whatever other organelle. It's some sort of an average 
that's coming from this inverse calculation of what the index of refraction of that phytoplankton is. And so again, it comes from inverse calculation. It's what's the index of refraction that matches best, for example, my scattering measurements when I know they're really good and were calibrated with homogeneous beads. Okay? So this is where, when you w wonder how did people come up with those indices of refraction for a phytoplankton, they came up from, from, uh, from this inverse calculation. But there's a beautiful paper by Haas in 1996 in Journal of Plankton Research. Well, he basically builds a phytoplankton from its component into its optical properties. He starts with, you know, this is lipids of this index of refraction when they're homogeneous. Sugars have this index of refraction. And in order to have the kind of optical properties we observe for phytoplankton, we need, they're mostly water, basically. And this is what lowers their index of refraction relative to, to uh, a particle that doesn't have water inside. And that goes back also to the aggregate modeling. OK, so here, let's do a little bit of examples. What's the likely beam attenuation for a given concentration? Just to sh give you a sense of why this is even useful. What's the likely beam attenuation for a given concentration of phytoplankton? OK, let's assume they have a radius of 20 microns, so they're big relative to their wavelength. So since Q is bounded between 2 and 0, I'll go with on the 2 side, or something like that. So let's say Q is about, my Q is about 2. The R is 20. My concentration, this is kind of a back on the concentration in the ocean, say 10 to the fifth cells per liter. It's reasonable. Which is, if I do it per meter cubed, 10 to the eighth. I'm saying that my efficiency factor is 2, so 2 times the area. I have the area pi r square, I have to change it into meter, 10 to the minus 12, end up with a beam attenuation on the order of 0.25 inverse meters. Totally reasonable, the kind of stuff we measured here. Why is the area not floating? Why is it? Because, again, my, this is my uh, cross-section. This is my optical cross-section. This is not the same C as this, sorry. This is the optical cross-section, this is the beam attenuation coefficient. Sorry for this extremely poor notation. But this is something it's totally. And then you can see, depending on how many cells you have in your culture, how this should change as you run it through. You can count them on a, whatever, on, on a microscope, and then you can get IOPs. Now, we'll see Paul Hill tomorrow. And you remember I show you a picture from his, from his, uh, from measurements that people done all over the world. Uh, the one that had beam attenuation on one, uh, a beam attenuation divided by mass on one axis, and on the other axis they had the, big, the, the maximum size of particle observed, or maximum beam attenuation observed. But then the average value was around 0.5 meters square per gram as the mass specific beam attenuation. We can ask, is this sensible? based on what we know about light theory. Let's, let's check. Again, let's assume we're dealing with particles that are big enough relative to the index of refraction, the, the big enough relative to the wavelength that we can assume a QC of 2. But this isn't, maybe 1 is better because we're still on the uprise, but we'll see. We can correct it afterwards. Oh, this should be C. C, this should be, oh, there's a, sorry. I'm just going to fix this because I'm, Otherwise, it will be really confusing. So this is C60. This is normalized by uh, back to here. OK. Come on. OK. Finish the first one. We're doing the second one. OK. So I'm saying that the mass normalized beam attenuation, this should be 660, is 0 0.5 meters square per gram. This is simply should be, um, what have I done here? Let's do it from scratch. OK. So my C60 that Paul 
reports is 0 point, based on measurements that people have done, meter square per gram, which means that the way this is calculated is beam attenuation. Beam attenuation should be concentration times C x, which is Q of about 2, times cross-sectional area, so pi d squared over 4. This is what I have at the top. And on the bottom, I have mass. Mass is concentration times volume times density. Concentration goes away. I mess with volume and density. Volume is pi d cube over 8, if I'm not mistaken. Density is 2.5 gram per centimeter cube, or 2.5 10 to the 6 gram per meter cube. Gram uh, 10 to the 6. And if I go through this calculation, I'm going to end up with a radius of about 1.2 micron. 1.2 micron is a realistic size for clay. So say, and if I change my Q by a factor of so the reason I'm ending up with a D, I have D cube here. I can take it out. I can move the D to this side. Uh, and then I can divide by 0 0.5. And I have a, an equation that relates the diameter or the radius straight to all these other numbers. And what I'm asking is, what is the diameter that will give me this if I assume me calculation? And what I'm finding is, first it's proportional to Q. So if I took a Q of 1, which might be more realistic to this side in retrospect, I'll get, half the, I'll get something like half the size, uh, which again is a size for clay. So muds, this is very consistent with the type of beam attenuation I'm going to expect from muds. So consistency. I can go to the literature, get numbers, and test them against uh, me theory. I just have to correct a bunch of things here. They were. They were, but it turns out sand doesn't stay in suspension much. If sand was dominating, uh, you're going to get a much lower number. And indeed, we find that as in places where C is very large, so you're in active resuspension, you have that, that C star goes down relative to 0.5. It's lower. So this, when you see stuff, the stuff that stays behind the some people call it the uh, stranded population of particles tend to be small material that doesn't sink fast. So this is consistent. So it, this is very useful because it, it links concentration of particles, something that's very tangible for a sedimentologist, to what he measures with his beam transmissometer in the field. So there was one for phytoplankton ecologists, one for sedimentologists. Okay, these are resources, different books that you may want to look. There's a, codes are found here. And those of you this afternoon, we're going to do MATLAB exercise. Those who want to do it in Python can find the Python code here. Those who want to do it in R can find an R code here. It's not going to be exactly what we're going to do, but the basic codes I'm using come from this book. At the end of it, there's a code in Fortran that I translate to MATLAB. Uh, that simply does the summation of the me of the me solution. There's another code here also for coated spheres, so spheres that have a coat around them that we've used again, that I've used in in, in some application. But you, there's a lot of them. People share them. It's very nice. So if you prefer not to work in MATLAB but in something else, they're available. But this afternoon, I'll, I'll give you MATLAB codes and with drivers to drive the BHME. It's called BHME, Born in Hoffman, me code. It's not the only me codes around, but these have become notorious because of the book. Uh, they might, I mean, criteria on when convergence has happened. Uh, some might use other spherical harmonics that allows them to do differently in, uh, in certain regime. But overall, the, I mean, I've n you test them. There's a, the, the other famous code, and, and I've tested it against BHME uh, because Ken asked me as a reviewer once, 
Whereby, which is the Miko do you used to use? Wiscom? Wiscom. 